welcome, Pastor. Thank you so much, our senior pastor. Let's appreciate him. And uh, also as we thank God for him bringing uh, our senior pastor back safely, we have actually become international as far as missions is concerned. And um, I'm excited. And I want to believe that God will continue helping us to serve him, especially in taking the gospel in where it is needed most. Um, I want to bring to us this which looks like the concluding message concerning Gideon. I think we have heard quite a bit about Gideon. And um, was Gideon successful? Uh, he looked quite successful in what he did from chapter 6. And we are now in uh, the last part of his life. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't end well. And that is what we want to look at and ask ourselves, what can we learn so that um, whatever may not have been a good example, we will be better than what, uh, what he did. So uh, we're just going to look at the portions of this scripture, chapter 8, which is 35 verses. And we are going to look at it in three parts. And um, I don't know whether there is a time that you felt quite successful. You know, you, I mean, there is something that you are looking forward to and you saw it happen and it has come to exactly like what you intended. You know, some of us, when we were in school, we were just looking forward to when we could be able to just join university, you know. And you feel that if you got there, that was quite a success. And, you know, others, it just, God, just give me a job, which you will not even have to earn a lot of money. If I can just get 40,000, I'll just be okay, you know. And I mean, that to such a person would be success. But uh, somebody said that indeed, um, it is more dangerous to be successful than to fail. You know, because there is danger of how do you handle success so that it doesn't leave you um, probably even worse than you were before. And we know some people who have been successful uh, we know that now we have the Olympic Games which are going on, and there are people who will win medals, and there are people who have won medals in many of these sports. And some have even become very rich as far as, uh, you know, even with a lot of sports. And some of their lives have not ended well. And we know that even in many instances of people who have been successful but their lives don't seem to have added well. And we have something to learn from Gideon, but we want to just appreciate also the part of his life which was very exemplary. And uh, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7 and verse 8 that the end of a matter is better than the beginning, and patience is better than pride, and um, we are looking at that caution of what pride does. It's not a good thing to talk about pride. But this essentially is what usually brings down people who may have been successful. And also the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 18, warns us about uh, pride. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be able to scroll that, but... I'll, I'll just ask the media team to help me take those notes along. And um, I don't know whether you have heard of uh, this, uh, this saying that pride comes before, before fall. And, you know, sometimes we think it's a saying that is common out there. But do you know it is in the Bible? It's actually in the Bible. Proverbs 16, verse 18. But one word that I like from this Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 8 is the word patience. You know, the Bible says patience is better than pride. And you have to choose one. 
It has to be you working through patience, and in this case, it means going through certain sufferings. That is actually the Hebrew translation of it is suffering, because if we are to make it in life in a successful way and yet glorifying God, we have to allow ourselves to also experience the suffering and the patience that is needed to be able to maintain ourselves in a sense of humility in the midst of success. And therefore, we have to, uh, to have de denial, uh, self-denial, what you can call self-denial, which are sacrifices that we may have to make, but especially the denial of self. Now, having said that, I want to say that uh, this chapter can be looked at in three different sections. And uh, Gideon has basically mobilized uh, the people, the 300 that God uh, asked him to, to use to, um, uh, to go after the Midianites. But uh, as you realize in chapter 7, it is not just the 300 that brought the victory, but he was even able to mobilize the other communities, part of the community, uh, all these other peoples, and they are mentioned there in verse 23, uh, the Naphtali, the Asher, and all Manasseh, they were called out and they pursued the Midianites uh, because it was not just the few, but everyone within the community needed to participate in this. But also there is this group of the uh, Ephraimites that was also involved in this um, mission that Gideon was leading the Israelites to do against the Midianites. But we begin chapter 8 looking at how they express discontentment, how they begin complaining, and you see that in verse 1 to verse 3, and that is uh, what we'll be looking at, you know, the dissatisfaction of the Ephraimites. But then we also look at uh, verse 4 to verse 21, which um, is an account about uh, what uh, um, Gideon did to go after the two kings of the um, Midianites, that is Ziba and Zalmunna, and probably your Bibles have given that as the title of that chapter 8. And uh, particularly the discouragement that he encounters with these two communities of the Israelites from Sakoth and Peniel. And that is the second thing that we are going to look at. The discouragement in this mission. This is the mission of God that God had called Gideon to accomplish together with the rest of the children of Israel. But then also, which is the main thing that we are to focus on, is the life of Gideon and how he disengaged the disengagement of Gideon. And those, uh, that is where we are going to look at what this pride is about. But first, let's look at this uh, group of people, the Ephraimites, who are dissatisfied. They were discontented and they actually complained. And the complaint that they made is that they were not as involved with this uh, mission to the, uh, against the Midianites like the other communities of Israel. But they had just been given a literal role to pray. And this was to stand on River Jordan and uh, stop the Midianites from closing and probably getting access to the water. And uh, they complained, why didn't you involve us like the others? And so that we can celebrate, you know, you can have a joy of celebrating this kind of success when the Midianites are defeated. But uh, Gideon answered in verse 2, what have we accomplished compared to you? Aren't the greening of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abiezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite readers, into your hands. What, uh, what was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subdued. And this uh, was very wise of Gideon, and we can 
continue to celebrate Gideon's life, that even at this time, God is using him with this kind of humility. You can see what he expresses there and says, even if it was just the, uh, the greening of the grapes, uh, you should not ignore that role that you have played. Indeed, you have even been able to smite Oreb and Zeb, some of the leaders of the Midianites. And that humility and the way he responded to these people averted a crisis, what could have even brought conflict between him and uh, the Israelites and uh, some of these Israelites. And therefore, we see how uh, members of community can also find themselves in this kind of complaint because of despising or ignoring the responsibility that they have been given and they, uh, they, they assume that they will not also partake as much of celebration. You know, it happens especially with the people who are seen mostly in public, that they mostly receive accolades, and we forget that there are others who may have played just that one small role in that particular mission, probably for what we are going to do in Gishagi. I don't know what role you have played, but you must not ignore whatever God has entrusted to you to do. And uh, uh, you will also be part of the blessing that comes. But again, you see this kind of uh, pride also that is expressed by these Ephraimites. And there is something that we can learn from that, even as uh, people who are called to one mission, you know, God does not have two missions. It's the mission of reconciliation, the mission of saving uh, the nations. It's the mission of getting known to the Midianites and to the people that have not known him. And we are all joined together as, as a church, as a community, as a people. God does not see division, does not see difference. He does not see that there is one who is better than the other. And that is what we can learn. And may we people that can be able to express humility and acceptance of what God has appointed us to do in his mission. Then the second thing is the discouragement that Gideon encounters with these people of um, Sarko and Peniel. And he closes, he is pursuing the two kings of, um, of Midianites, Ziba and Zalmunna. He is pursuing after them. He says he has to accomplish the mission. One of the things that we will see from this uh, chapter 8 is indeed Gideon achieved the mission that God had called him to do. He fulfilled it. He did it to the end. You know, he did not stop at the middle. And these people of uh, Sarkoth and Peniel were actually discouraging him from continuing to complete uh, this mission of God. And you see um, uh, there Gideon in verse 4, he is with his three-hearted men, exhausted and keeping up the pursuit. Uh, you know, the Bible says, yet keeping up the pursuit. And he came to Jordan and crossed it. And he said to the men of Sarkoth, give my troops some bread. They are worn out, and I am still pursuing Ziba and Zalumuna, the kings of Midian. And what do these uh, leaders of Sarkoth say? They say, do you already have the hands of Ziba and Zalumuna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your troops? You know, and so they are giving conditions of uh, giving them support and being part of this mission. Um, because maybe they ignored also this uh, role that they were to play of just giving them bread. Maybe they wanted to be told, can you also join us? But uh, Gideon was very clear that God had appointed these three-hearted men. And this is very interesting, and, um, and you see that also in verse 10 that indeed none of the 300 men that Gideon had been given by God were lost. This is indeed God's doing, and you can say uh, that this cannot be explained in any way. You see even in verse 10 that uh, they were facing 15,000 men of the Midianites, 
that were under the command of Ziba and Zalmuna. And you can clearly see that the battle was fought by the Lord. It cannot be the three-hearted people against 15,000 men. But the people of Sarkoth uh, did not want to give bread, and they are giving the conditions for them to support this mission. And sometimes we find uh, uh, even, even among us as believers and people uh, you know, in the community who would actually be a discouragement because they are asking, are you sure that you are going to get results in this mission? You know, sometimes results are very important. And um, sometimes we, we, you wonder, are we listening to, to God? Are we obeying God? Or are we asking, what shall we receive there? Are people going to accept the faith? Are people going to come to Christ? Are people going to receive the gospel? Are we going to be able to, uh, to, 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 to do a successful work there? You know, what do you see the possibility of us getting a harvest? And uh, as we have even been told, our responsibility and our call is to share the gospel, is to get the message out there. It is not to ask how many people will come to faith, because it is the Lord who is going to save. But as the Bible says, they cannot be able to receive Christ, they cannot be saved unless if they listen, unless if they hear. And I know even the work that we are doing on the coast, sometimes it looks too much, it looks a lot of investment, it looks a lot of cost. And uh, sometimes we could be asking, do we have the heart of Ziba and Zalumuna? Do we have people who are coming to faith? And we are, you know, I'm not going to continue supporting this mission that doesn't seem to be uh, bringing fruits. And, 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 you know, this is what uh, Gideon was being told by the officials, by the leaders of this particular community. We are not going to give until when you bring that. And Gideon now, he wants them and he actually says passionately, I know that the Lord will give them to us, you know. Uh, just for that, when the Lord has given, and it is because this is a mission of faith. The mission of God is always a mission of faith. It cannot be a mission of sight. And that is what the Lord has called us, not to walk by sight, but to walk by faith. And I like Gideon, the way he was very uh, committed and focused on this particular mission, and being assured and being persuaded that the Lord is going to give a harvest, that the Lord is going to bring the mission to a conclusion and in a triumphant way to his glory, and that indeed the Ziba and Zalmuna will be given to his hand. And we find another group of people also, the people of Sarkoth, he went down to them and he asked for the same, uh, the people of Peniel. And when he asked, uh, the men of Peniel said, um, uh, they made, he made a request, and, but they answered as the men of Sarkoth. They just answered in the same way. And probably is the same reason that they did not uh, feel they wanted to be in this mission, uh, that they would just give bread and they are not going to earn probably the, uh, the, the praise of having uh, been able to defeat the Midianites. But uh, Gideon continues and continues with a lot of passion, and uh, may the Lord help us that we are going to have the passion to be able to pursue the mission of God even when we are facing discouragements, because discouragements will be there. The people that sometimes you expect will be able to stand with you in what God has called you to do in that place of work where he has called you to be a witness. You probably are getting discouragement and it is becoming like you are not the person to be uh, appreciated even for the hard work that you do. And it's all because you have become a witness of Christ there. But are we going to be discouraged? Are you going to still continue to be focused on this mission like Gideon? I love this spirit of Gideon that he says, I know that the Lord will bring me even to that uh, victory over uh, Ziba and Zalmuna. And so Gideon continues. And then we are seeing um, 
how he pursues these, uh, 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 these kings, and uh, the Bible says he actually gets hold of them, and uh, he, uh, he kills them, and you can see that uh, Gideon went by the loot of nomads east of Zoba, that's verse 11, and Jagoha, and attacked the unsuspecting army. Ziba and Zalmuna, the two kings of Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. This is amazing. This is actually only God who can do. And this encourages me a lot. It doesn't matter how difficult a mission looks, how difficult God's call looks, even for anyone, but we know that the Lord is able to do even more than we can imagine. Destroying this kind of 15,000 army with 300 uh, fighters. And Gideon, uh, now after he had defeated, uh, he went back to the people of Sarkoth and the people of uh, uh, Peniel, and uh, the Bible gives an account there of what he does in revenge, as he had promised. And I can say that this is, was the beginning of the downfall of Gideon. Because he did not acknowledge that indeed it was God's grace, it was God's help, it is God working through him, it doesn't matter whether there are people who have opposed him, people who have expressed dissatisfaction, people who have rejected him. I mean, you have not been given blood, but you have still been able to pursue. How could it have been were it not for the grace of God? That he helps you even to go without food, without drink, and you can be able to accomplish the mission. And I know that there are people that God has used even against a lot of odds, even where they have not been adequately supported. I always encounter those kind of missionaries even in different fields in this country where you find like somebody has even like been neglected by his church, but he is still continuing and the Lord is bringing people to faith through him. And this is what we see, but we must not be people who are going to complain again and people who are going to want to avenge ourselves, but acknowledge that it is the Lord who has helped us. And in that kind of humility, you are going to avoid any kind of pride that may come. But that is the beginning of the downfall of Gideon. And this is what we want to look at, uh, because what he does is the same thing that he uh, he blames Ziba and Zalmuna about. He was asking them, who did you kill? And they said, we, kill, uh, we killed people just like you, who looked like you, princes like you, people who were Israelites like you. And he actually said, those were my brothers that you killed, and therefore I have, we have also to kill you. But you see that Gideon goes against his own country people, against his own tribesmen. He, uh, he, uh, he punishes uh, the elders of Sarkoth and kills some of them. But again, Penuel, he kills so many people who had gathered at a particular tower and many lives were lost. And so you ask yourself, was this led of the Lord? Is this what God led him to do? And as you are going to fight, this is actually out of uncontrolled anger of, of Gideon. But let's look at the disengagement of Gideon. And as I have mentioned, it, begin, it begins a bit of that. But uh, you see that Gideon seemed to have self-confidence. Uh, you can imagine this is somebody who has come from the back of nowhere, he was not known, and he was very timid, as we have seen. He's somebody who was not even sure that God could be able to use him. He's somebody who expressed that kind of weakness and fear. But now, with the time, he seemed to have gained experience. He seemed to have gained confidence, you know, and this confidence has even gone beyond being the confidence in God to somewhat becoming self-confidence. And um, this reminds me, and you see in verse 22, uh, we'll, we'll look at verse 22 now to the end. And um, 
after he had defeated the Midianites. And the Bible says that they did not rise up again. In verse 22, now he is being invited by the Israelites and he is being told, can you become our king? The Israelites say to Gideon, rule over us. You, your sons, your grad uh, son, and because you have saved us from the heart of Midian. But Gideon told them, but you can see that verse 22, that you have saved us from the heart of the Midian. And uh, Gideon rep replies in a very nice way. Uh, he says, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Praise the Lord. I mean, it looks very nice, very exciting, now giving the glory to God. But what follows after that is actually a contradiction. And he said, I do not have, uh, end verse 24, and, I, and he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me a nearing of your share of the Prada, uh, it was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. So he had a special request. So he says, well, yeah. And you can see the statement of the Israelites there that you have saved us from the heart of the Midianite. It seemed to have entered into the head of Gideon. And he had now turned to look like he was the deliverer. Because when he is told, okay, don't uh, rule over us, and he says, I will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. He acts in the opposite way when he begins now asking for a reward. He begins asking for a share of the plunder. And one of the things that he does, again, is that he actually from there on, and if you read, you will see, he actually disengages from any kind of being that kind of a judge or a warrior who would continue to fight for the Israelites. And now he takes a break. And now he actually go, retreats and goes home. That is what the Bible says. He actually went home. And you will see one of the things that he has done is to actually disengage from, from warfare. He disengages from what you can say, prayer. He disengages from continuing to stand against the Midianites. And this reminds me of what happened with David. You remember when David took a break from going to war and he was left in the Paris and he was having a time to relax and was only uh, waiting to receive news from the battlefield. And you know that that was not the tradition of uh, the kings, they needed to go to war. And actually, the time that David failed to go was a time that the kings were going to war. And therefore, we see of that kind of disengagement and the disaster that it would have. But I want to mention just a number of things that uh, Gideon did, which kind of he sought to do, which build on uh, on, on the pride that he had and which brought him to a fall. And one of the things is that what we have seen, seeking revenge. And this exposes the temper or the anger that Gideon had. And this reminds us that there are points of weaknesses that we could have as persons, as individuals. We could be weak in certain areas and we may not be watchful. And if we are not watchful, we are going to express ourselves without control and uh, it is going to bring us to a downfall. Because you can imagine even having uh, killed his own tribesmen, how that leaves him even in a relationship with them. But the second thing also was what we have seen speaking and acting in the opposite way. When he was asked to become king and he said, no, I will not be the king, but again, he asked for a favor. And this, you can say, was an act of corruption. You know, where he says, that which you have gotten from the battlefield, the booty that you have been able to get, can you give it to me? That is all that I want. I will not be king. But um, again, uh, this uh, is, is reminding us that sometimes 
we could be uh, not watchful of our lives. And the Bible says that we should be watchful of our lives and our doctrine. And even those people that we lead. And uh, as we are going to see that uh, he led these people in this way. And he became such, you know, he was initially a good example. And uh, he used to say, do as I am doing. And these people continue to do what uh, he wishes and what um, he is doing, as we are going to see, the worship of idols. And so you can say he is one who was seeking opulence. And you can say that from this battle, he actually became a, a dollar millionaire, you know? Because he got about 17 kilograms of gold. And you can imagine how much that would be, even of today. But that is where he is rewarding himself. And this reminds me of how even some of the disciples were asking Jesus, now we have left everything and we have come to follow you. What shall we receive in return? And there are people that God has used in many ways and uh, for a long time. And sometimes they see like, is my life not getting better, especially when it comes to, uh, to finances and benefits from ministry, you know, and sometimes they get to a point where they begin rewarding themselves, and they become now people who are pursuing wealth and not just pursuing the mission of God to accomplish what God has called them to do. And that is what we see happening with Gideon, who uh, was used of God with uh, anointing, and anointing is good. But then he says, what shall I receive after law? I need a favor from you. But also he was, um, he was drawn into what you can say is the popular worship that was happening. This was the disaster that the Israelites were going through or were experiencing where they got into worship of Baal. And you can remember even at the beginning uh, how uh, Gideon got this name, Jelub Baal which you can say was a pagan name that he was given by the Midianites because of destroying uh, Baal. But now he gets into the same trap and he joins that popular worship, the worship of idols, and with the gold that he had received, he decided to make an effort. An effort was one that was being used by the Israelites uh, along with uh, by the priests, to understand the will of God, to be able to hear from God. But now he turns not into hearing from God, but into divination. Because it was put in a particular place and it became a center of worship. And the Bible says that Gideon himself was worshiping. You can imagine. He stopped worshiping God. He got disengaged with the worship of God. God disengaged from prayer. God disengaged from the word of God. God disengaged from, you know, the fellowship and desire to be uh, supported by others. And now he retreated actually to his home. That is what the Bible says uh, in verse 29. It says, Jerubbabel, son of Joash, went back home to live. Is this not retirement? Uh, this looks like now the mission is done. I have nothing more to do. And we have heard you should not take retire even at 82. You know, I mean, but the mission of God will not be accomplished when we just are able to do what we think we are doing at the moment, but asking, is it yet the end? The gospel must get to the end of the world and then the end will come until Jesus Christ comes. You know, sometimes we get tired even with the prayer. We get tired with reading the word, you know. I mean, and we can say that uh, Gideon disengaged from the discipline of that everyday life. But he went back home to live. And what did he do when he went back to live? He actually got many wives. And he even married from the Canaanites, the Shechem, the people of Shechem. You know, because now he has disengaged with the battle. He has disengaged with the mission of God. He has said, now it is all done. Now I can enjoy the fruit of my labor. But remember that whatever you get here on earth cannot be compared with what is awaiting us in the kingdom of God in heaven. 
And therefore, we must not allow ourselves to reward ourselves, but to, to trust God in this life, who will reward us appropriately here and also in the, in the days to come. But you can see even what Gideon does, now not listening to God, and he does that what God had raised him to stand against. And the marriage of this Shechem uh, concubine uh, actually gave birth to one who was called Abimelech. And Abimelech, as we will see later in chapter 9, he becomes that evil uh, son of Gideon who actually kills others and becomes king. But the word Abimelech, the name Abimelech actually means my father is king. And this is the name that Gideon gives this son because at this particular time, what he had said that he would not become, he has become. He has become the king. He has become not only rich, but he has become powerful. He has become influential. And now it is time to enjoy the labors of his work. But what do we say from this? What we say is we need humility, not only to begin, but also to add well. And uh, this is what Paul reminds the Philippians, and he says that I have not yet arrived. I have not yet reached. It doesn't matter how God has used me, but I am not yet there. But I continue to press on to the goal of my calling. And we must remember that the goal of our calling is not the blessings that we can receive here, but Paul says it is the heavenward calling in Christ Jesus. But as we finish, I want to read this scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39. And I'm encouraged by these words that even though we know that there are people who have allowed pride to get into their minds, that there is still those that have continued and they continue to the end, and I want to believe that you are one of them. And this is what Paul actually uh, says about uh, the people of, uh, of uh, that he was, okay, not Paul, we are not sure who wrote this book of Hebrews, but the, the author was writing to these people and he says to them, you need to persevere to that where, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive that which he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, um, but my righteous one will live by faith and take no pleasure in one who shrinks back. And this is what he says, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. And that is what I believe, even for us, that we are not going to be among those who may be compromised and shrink back. But let us learn from this story of Gideon and the account of Gideon and just pray that we will not only just begin well and continue well, but we will add well giving all the glory and the praise to the Lord, knowing that there is a reward that is waiting for us, not here today. We might get it here or not, but we know that there is an assurance in the life to come. And for that reason, we will continue on fighting in this battle and not be disengaged from our relationship with God. May the Lord bless us and may the Lord help us that we will not be of those who shrink back, but of those who remain to the end, to the glory of his name. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor, for that great reminder. The goal of our calling is not the blessings here, but the enduring faith that leads to eternal life in Christ Jesus. What is the Lord saying to us? What is the Lord saying to you as you hear all these messages, and especially about Gideon? Let me invite the music team as they come and as we reflect on that word, as we come to the end of the service. Have you been discouraged in the mission that God has given us and has called us in our walk with him?
Have you been misunderstood? Have you taken it upon yourself to pay back evil for evil? Are there things you have allowed to be a trap for you? As we reflect on these words, I pray we will turn our eyes to Jesus. Turn our eyes to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace Jesus to you we lift our eyes Jesus our glory and our prize we adore you behold you our savior ever true We turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens. Our King will return for his own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout. Oh, glory to Jesus alone. Our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, a Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Indeed, O Lord, we choose to turn our eyes to you. We choose to fix our eyes on you, who changes not. Thank you that, Lord, we look back to learn how to walk with you today in ways that bring glory and honor to your name. Forgive us, O Lord, for the times where, like Gideon, we have allowed discouragement or we have allowed being misunderstood to get the best of us when it comes to what you have called us to do. 
Yet, God, you have called us to make you known, to live in a way, O oh God, that many more will know you and live for you. So we thank you for the gift of Jesus who brings us a new life that we can walk in victory. We can walk. And that's why, Lord, we choose to turn our eyes to you. It's easy to turn to the things of this world. It's easy to turn to the things that discourage us, to the things that hold us back. It's easy to turn back and forget the 300 who you chose to fight this fight, that it was all about you. And so, God, the victories in our lives are from you, and it is not even about us. And so we pray that, God, indeed, we will turn our eyes to you. When we adore you, we behold you, our Savior ever true. And God, help us, Lord, to walk in a way that glorifies your name. The goal of our calling is not the blessings here. Often, Lord, we have misunderstood that, and we have chased after blessings. And we have forgotten the blessings that are eternal, that come only from you. The enduring faith that leads to eternal life. So we do pray, God, for the body of Christ to really turn our eyes to you. That in all that we do, you, O oh God, will be the focal point of everything that we have. May we not lose sight of this and grow comfortable in these things. So we thank you, Lord, for your word. And as we meditate on it, we pray that God will continue to walk in your ways. For this is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Let me request us to rise up as we share the words of benediction. May the God who guided Gideon with a small but faithful band lead you in every mission he has called you to, reminding you that victory comes through faith and not sight. May you, like Gideon, persevere through misunderstanding, discouragement, conditional support, knowing that God's mission is to bring many sons to glory. Amen. As Ecclesiastes 7-8 has reminded us, the end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. May you walk in patience, avoiding the traps of pride and entitlement, staying vigilant against the allure of popular worship that distracts us from true devotion. And may the Lord strengthen you to remain steadfast in prayer, as Paul urges us in Ephesians 6.18. And keep your heart focused on God's eternal purposes. Be ever watchful, designing the times, and faithful in all your endeavors for the kingdom. Go forth with the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Do you believe to We adore you, behold you, a Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you.